I'm Scott Walker and this is Walks on the Wild Side. This video is the first in a four-part series on how to compose images for wildlife photographers. Welcome to Walks on the Wild Side, the channel where I aim to help you capture the beauty of the natural world in your camera. So in this series on composition, we're going to cover all sorts of things. Depth of field, backgrounds and foregrounds, visual flow, position of the photographer, aspect ratio, and all sorts of things. But we're going to start with the most fundamental, the position of your subject in the frame. Now, as a wildlife photographer, it's really important to be able to compose images quickly to react and respond to what your subject is doing. And that takes practice, it takes time, but it will help to have these different techniques in your toolkit that you can pull out when they're needed. So before you ever think about pressing the shutter, it's important to decide what type of photo you want to take. Is it a portrait shot of your subject? Is it a behavioural shot of your subject doing something? Or is it an environmental shot that shows off your subject in the area that they live? And knowing what type of shot you're going to take will help you choose the right compositional technique to use. Now, composition theory has existed for a long time. It's been around before even cameras were invented, and it's been used by artists for hundreds of years to structure and compose their paintings. And we, as photographers, inherit that today. So the first technique we're going to talk about today is centre composed images. And this is probably the most basic style of composition, but it's really useful for portrait shots. Now the idea is that you want to put your subject smack bang in the centre of the frame and fill as much of the frame with them as you can, while still leaving a gap around the edge so that it's aesthetically pleasing. So here's an example of a kingfisher that I took, and you'll see that the kingfisher fills an awful lot of the frame, but that allows us to see a lot of the detail. If I zoom in, you can look right at the detail of the feathers, the variation of color, and this will print out nicely so that you can still see all that great detail. Next up, I want to talk about composing by thirds. Now, you may have heard this referred to as the rule of thirds, but I don't like that term. Because it has the word rule in it, it leads lots of new photographers to think that that's the way they have to compose. And that's by far not the case. There are loads of ways to compose. But the rule of thirds or composing by thirds is a very important technique. And it's existed for a couple of hundred years. It was first used by the English painter, Sir Joshua Reynolds. And it was been written about maybe about 10 years after he started using it but it's been very powerful and been used by artists and photographers ever since. Now, imagine that your photo is divided into nine rectangles by two horizontal lines and two vertical lines that are placed exactly a third apart. And the idea is that you want to put important points of your subject at the intersection of those lines. So that might be, for example, the beak of a bird. You also want to put secondary subjects to run along those lines. So that could be the branch of a tree that the bird is sat upon. And using this technique in combination with other compositional devices will get you some really nice pictures. Next, I'm going to cover negative space. And understanding negative space is one of the most important things you can do whilst learning to compose images. So let's define it. What is negative space? Well, you can think of positive space as all the areas of your photo where something is happening. So typically that's the subject. And the negative space is all the area around that where nothing is happening. So usually it's a background that's maybe blurred out slightly, but you want to provide a good balance between positive and negative space. Too much positive space can make things overpowering in the photo. So we saw the Kingfisher photo earlier where the kingfisher filled a lot of the frame. And that's great for portrait shots, but for other type of shots like action or environmental, filling the frame isn't a great thing to do. 
and we'll have a look at why. So let's take a look at some examples. In this picture of a grey seal cow roaring, I've left some negative space in front of her face. And you're wondering what she's looking at, what's making her roar. Now, if I'd cropped close to her face so there was no negative space in front of it, you wouldn't be left with those feelings and wonder. It also feels quite unbalanced between the positive and negative space. Likewise, in this silhouette of a red deer stag breathing on a misty morning, there's a lot of negative space, and it gives some clues as to the subject's environment. You can see the grasses in the negative space, and it adds something to the ambience and atmosphere of the picture. So thinking about negative space and making sure you don't have too much positive space in the photo can be really powerful. And next, we're going to talk about a technique that's very closely related to negative space, and that is space for movement. When you're photographing a moving subject, it can be really useful to leave some negative space in front of your subject in the direction that they're moving in. Let's have a look at some examples. So with this blue tit, I've placed it at the intersection of composing by thirds, and that leaves a lot of space for the viewer to imagine that the bird is flying into. This image of a barn owl, I've offset the owl for some space for it to move into, but the rest of the negative space gives you some clues about its environment. It's hunting across some grassy fields, flying low, so it keeps its eyes peeled for small prey to pounce upon. Leaving some negative space for movement allows your viewer to be able to imagine what happens next. And that's really important because we're always telling stories through photography. So this is a story about your subject's life at that point in time. And so your viewer wants to know and wants to understand what's happening. And the negative space will allow their imagination to fill in the gaps that your photo can't. Now, it can be really difficult to offset your images when you're starting to capture subjects in flight for the first time, and it takes a lot of practice. Now, I would recommend simply trying to get your subject in the centre of the frame, and then in post-production, in Lightroom, Photoshop, or whatever software you use, you can crop some of the photo away to offset the subject. Now, many people will tell you you shouldn't do that, and in the long run, you don't want to be doing it. And the reason for that is that you crop away so much of the photo that you lose data, you lose quality. And when the remaining parts of the photo are stretched out to be able to be printed big, then you can end up with fuzzy pictures, pixelated pictures, and it doesn't look good. But to start with, whilst you're getting used to capturing birds in flight or animals on the run, it can be very difficult to offset. And also to start with, you're probably publishing your photos on Instagram, Facebook, places like that, which publish them at really low resolution anyway. So it doesn't matter that you're losing that data because they're gonna be published at such low resolution, you're not gonna be able to tell. So for me, I would recommend to start with, try to capture your subject in the center of the frame and crop to leave that space to move. And as you practice more and more, focus on getting your subject offset to one side, approximately composing by thirds, to give that space for movement. Moving on, let's talk about reflections. Now, having reflections in photos are great compositional devices. In this photo of a juvenile moorhen, the reflections add something nice. It gives you some clues as to what's happening. The bird's bending down. Is it taking a drink from the water or is it going to eat an insect from the surface of the water? So the reflection helps you to understand what's going on. And you'll see in the photo that the reflection isn't perfect. There are some ripples on the water. And it's worth knowing that many photos that you see out there that perhaps are on Instagram and places like that, you see perfect reflections and there aren't many places in nature where you get a perfect reflection. So be careful when comparing your images to others because that reflection may have been added in Photoshop. Here's one of my favorite reflection photos. It was taken at a reflection table, which is one of the few places you can find perfect reflections because the water is so shallow, it doesn't move and your subject isn't in the water moving it. It's not a perfect photo, 
The blue tit on the right started to move, and as it moved, it moved out of the plane of focus. So it's slightly less in focus than the blue tit on the left. But who cares? The only people who worry about that kind of stuff are other photographers, pixel peepers, people who want to look upon and judge your photos. But most people will see this and say, you've captured a nice moment. So whether you're in a position to get a perfect reflection or an imperfect one where there are ripples on the water, for me, it's a good thing. If your viewer were to go to that pond and look at the water, they would see some movement. They would see those ripples because the bird is moving the water. And so your photo looks natural. So reflections are symmetry in your photos, but it doesn't just have to be reflections that provide that symmetry. Symmetry in general is a great compositional device. In this photo of a grey seal bull, I've zoomed right into his face to get a cropped image of it. To get symmetrical photos, it can be really useful if you position yourself so that your subject's whole body is angled towards you and they're looking at you such as this photo of a grey seal cow, where the symmetry is really what makes the picture. Now, a slightly more advanced compositional technique is to use diagonals and triangles in your photo. So remember earlier we saw the composing by thirds grid. This time, imagine a slightly different grid. Imagine there's a diagonal line running from one of the lower corners to the opposite top corner. And then from the other two corners, there are lines that join the first line at right angles. And you can use these lines to form triangles in your photos. So this kingfisher's wing runs along one of these lines and forms a triangle. Thinking about composing in this way takes a lot of getting used to. So for newer photographers, you might simply want to think about getting diagonal lines in your photos particularly if they run from an edge intersection of the thirds grid to another intersection or to one of the corners, like this photo of a chaffinch. The line from one grid point to another forms a triangle. So hopefully you can see how we're starting to combine some of these different compositional devices, whether that is composing by thirds combined with space for movement, or whether that is composing by thirds combined with diagonals and triangles. Using these different devices in combination can be really effective. Framing your subject can be a really nice way to show off its environments, and you want to use some of those environmental features to provide a frame around your subject. So that might be some leaves from a tree that just poke in from the edges. There are other ways to frame your subject though. In this photo of a swan in flight, I framed it by the old bridge, the bush on the left, and the darker patch of water underneath it. So this virtual rectangle encloses the swan and shows off the environment that the swan is currently in. We'll talk about framing, backgrounds and foregrounds more in a later video in this series. Leading lines are another great tool to use for environmental shots. And leading lines are things that guide your viewer through the photo. They're often things that converge with perspective to aim your viewer's eye towards your subject. Now, these can be easier in an urban environment where there are lots and lots of straight lines, but you can often find straight lines in nature also, edges of ponds, branches of trees, things like that. Here's a good example from an urban environment. This is a gull I photographed at Canary Wharf, and the lines of the paving take your eye from the outer focus foreground to the in focus background where the action is happening. But not only that, it gives you some idea as to what the environment of that gull is. So next, let's talk about cropped composition. Most of the time, you'll want to be making sure you've got your whole subject in the frame because it can look really unnatural if the tips of wings go off the edges of frames or parts of your animal aren't in the frame. But sometimes it can be really useful to deliberately crop out elements. We've already seen my photo of the grey seal bull with most of its body cropped out, just its face in the frame. But there are other times where it can be useful to do this too. In this photo, you can see two red deer fighting. Now, 
I've cropped into their faces deliberately because when they're fighting, they can be at really awkward angles because their feet are trying to get a foothold in the ground as they push each other around. And that makes the photo look a little weird. But cropping into their faces, you can see the action, the important things that are going on. And so deliberately choosing to crop something out of the frame made for a much nicer picture. And the final thing I want to talk about today is not using any of these techniques at all. So you could use an unusual composition. There's nothing that says you have to use one of these techniques. In this photo of a gull diving for a fish, it shows how they don't like to get their wings underwater. The gull's body is missing from the photo, but it doesn't matter. It demonstrates a behavior, and that's what's important in this picture. So we've reached the end of part one, in which we've covered the most fundamental aspects of composition, and that is your subject's position in the frame. In the next video, we're going to talk about depth of field, backgrounds and foregrounds. So I hope you'll come back for that. You might want to consider subscribing so that you get notified when that video and the others in this series are published. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and I'd be grateful of any comments or questions that you've got. So please ask those in the comments section below and I'll answer them as soon as I can. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.